Okay, so like I said, I don't know that Mead sells a system that's less than a thousand millimeters that comes in their in their uh, SCT series on the fork mounts. I think they're all like eighteen hundred and above. So right there, you violated what I would say one of my big tenets is in astrophotography is going right to the long focal lengths. Oh, well, it's two thousand millimeter. Oh, it's two thousand, so even higher than that. Yeah, so it's it's pretty significant. Actually, my tenant is for that. It's an F6. They don't sell the They don't sell the yeah. Okay. Um, so again, the re another reason to start with your mount is you know if you look at your budget and you look at what you can afford and you say you know what I can really only afford a CG5 mount with basic tracking which is like a $300 mount. Hey, you know what you can do amazing things with that, but don't put a 2,000 millimeter focal length scope on it. You're just gonna you're just gonna pull your hair out. Get the uh, get the get the DSLR with a 200 millimeter f2.8 lens and put that on it and track with that and do some amazing wide field photography. You know, modify it, put an H alpha filter in there. You can do some great things with that setup. Uh, but starting with the mounts, kind of like the foundation, you need to lay it right before you jump into the next things. Okay, um, and please jump in with any questions. Some some terms that are used, and I know I'm probably just missing a thousand of them. So this would be a great example of maybe you could email me uh, things that I've missed. Germany Couture, we've talked about that. Fork mount, we've talked about that. Periodic error. For those of you who don't know what that is. <clears throat> Um, there are gears inside every mount system that cause it to move and track. Um, on a, on a, a German equatorial mount, there the most important is called the worm gear, and that is the gear that spins on the major, the main gear that sits on the axis and actually turns everything. It's 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 a worm gear, and it, it meshes with the teeth of a giant gear that goes around. What's that gear called? I don't even know. Big gear. The big gear. The worm gear. It's called the worm. It's called the worm. No, the worm gear is what the meshes. Worm and the worm gear. Is it? Oh, is it really? Yeah. The okay. little one's a worm, well, and the big one's a worm. Gear. Update with the data. Uh, good <laughs> updates to my terminology here, but okay. So, but anyway, those, those mate together, and those are gears, right? It's metal on metal for the most part. Um, well, no, nothing is manufactured perfectly. And if there's a slight imperfection in your gear, that's going to show up in terms of your tracking. So your mount's going to be tracking perfectly, perfectly. Hit that little bump and click. You're going to see a little movement in, in the tracking. It's not going to track quite. It's going to track a little faster, a little bit slower. It's going to move. Um, the apparent star is going to move when it hits that error. The nice thing is that that error can be mapped your gear goes around very consistently. <clears throat> so if you have periodic error correction, which is the next term on the list, you can actually create a map of that error and have your mount like slow down. It's like, hey, I'm coming up on a bump. I need to slow down my tracking a little bit because I know it's going to speed up as I go over this little bump in my worm gear. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Another important thing you can do, and I did this with my, uh, my loose Mandy mount, um, <laughs> is I actually took it apart put some nice gr new grease on there and I slewed it all night. I had it automatically slewing back and forth, back and mm -hmm. forth, back and it. forth, back and forth. I was lapping the gear basically by just working the two, working the gear. And what, what happens if you have a little bump? It gets, an, it gets a disproportionate amount of friction when it gets turned over. You do that long enough, you got a smooth gear. So you just keep doing it, keep doing that. And that, what that did for Milo's Mandy is it made my uh, periodic error go, graph go from being very rough and it would be like tracking and all of a sudden, bam, it would jump. It went to be much smoother because now instead of having a peak in the in the worm gear, I had a nice smooth hump instead of that. So it was much smoother and much much easier to guide out the error. And that finishes it up. That's what smooth periodic error means. You really want smooth PE. It's very difficult to uh, to, to uh, guide out if your mount changes, you know, shifts. Let's take my, my example, five arc seconds, and it does that in half a second. You know, that's a big jump over a very short period of time. Unless your auto guider is set at like. You know, unless your auto guider is set um, to uh, you know to, to track on by every point two seconds, if it's set for two second exposures, well, by the time it takes that exposure, the damage is done. The star has moved. <clears throat> so let's talk about optics. Not going to get through all this, um, but what I've done is I've laid out the different popular types of telescopes. And I'm just going to talk real quickly about the strengths and weaknesses of each one. Schmidt Crassegrain, tons of them out there. Lots of accessories available. All different types of telescopes. Um, very long in focal length, um, f10 or greater for the most part. Um, weaknesses, extreme coma. If you just throw a camera onto a Schmidt Cassegrain, you, it's like being in uh, Star Trek and being in warp drive. You're going to get really nice stars in the middle. As you get out towards the edges, the image degrades dramatically. You're going to see a lot of smearing and coma is going to come into, into play. They're really heavy for the aperture. I mean, a 10 inch telescope is, those things are heavy. Those little telescopes, and there's I don't I think there's only one or two manufacturers of, of Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes that I would consider to be superb optics. Um, in fact, I don't know of any to be honest with you. 
I don't know a band that make a really superb instrument. And when I say superb, I mean not only the optics, but mechanically superb. The focuser doesn't shift, the mirror is locked down. I mean, just a mechanically and optically superb instrument. Um, there's very few manufacturers of really superb optical instruments, by the way. Uh, Dahl Kirkham. This is an interesting one <coughs> um, because it's, it's actually um, uh, one of the better um, optics for astrophotography. It's, it's very, very flat field. It suffers from all the problems that you get with, with a schmidt cassegrain but the problem is the focal length is so long and the F ratio is so slow. It's so, it's like, these things are like F15 or higher for the most part. Um, they're very, very, all the, the smearing that you would see is, is gone. It's, it, 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 as you start to increase your focal length, the, the coma and those different aberrations starts to decrease dramatically. Um, so pretty, pretty significant. People use these for very long focal length imaging and they are very good. Uh, what, instruments. What scope is it? These are Dahl Kirkham telescopes. Dahl Kirkham. Yeah, it's, it's a two-based, uh, two-mirror type system. Um, the problem, of course, is that they're not very versatile. 1,500 millimeters is, is the minimum you're going to see with the Dahl Kirkham design for the most part. Um, and they're pretty. There are a couple of high-quality models available, but they're they're very expensive. Um, pretty pretty darn expensive. And they also have a small secondary mirror, which means your image circle. We'll talk about what that means. Is very small on these telescopes. Um, I don't think I've seen one bigger than 35 millimeters, or I, I don't think I've ever seen a Dahl Kirkham that produced a really big image circle. Again, long focal length means that people are using small, real high sensitivity chips for the most part. So if you have like an ST10 or something, it's great. It's a great pairing. Uh, Maxutov Cassegrain, uh, the Mead ETX series, uh, very, very familiar with these. Again, very, very long, uh, long focal length, 1500 millimeters or more. Um, a lot of uh, I don't know of any high quality manufacturers of these, maybe ITE, but I've never seen one or heard about them, so I can't really comment. Um, very heavy, um, very thick corrector plate on the front of these things, so they tend to be very heavy, and if you get into a large aperture, they're ridiculously expensive. Um, Schmidt Newtonian, Mead makes a bunch of these. Um, they still suffer from some coma, but it's, it's somewhat corrected, actually. Um, these are actually not, would not be a bad starter telescope. Um, the problems you're going to have with these are going to be the optical, uh, the optical quality. You know, it's going to be a Mead mass-produced telescope for the most part. The focuser quality is going to be pretty low on it, so you're going to struggle with that. Get a fast one, the fastest one that you possibly can. And not an insignificant problem with these, by the way, is going to be dew. Um, you've got a big corrector plate. It's like Schmidt. You know, dew is the, they're the first to go when it starts to dew up. So yeah. I think we have a coffee break coming. If, you, if anybody wanted coffee that had your hand up, work your way over here because I poured the half cups and you can dive it in case. I'll just keep going, guys, because yeah. there's a lot, and yeah. I want to get to the processing. You have a huge amount of information. Yeah. I want to get to the processing, because I know yeah. that's why most people are here, and I don't want to bore that's you guys. That's okay, but hey, Jeff, this is great. Okay, uh, Newtonian. Um, this is one of the most popular. Everybody's got a Newtonian. I mean, it's, you know, it's really, really popular um, out there. Lots of manufacturers. Um, a, huge, um, uh, a huge variety of manufacturers are available. Um, the, you know, so they're very reasonable cost. Lots of imaging accessories, add-ons. They suffer from some coma problems. Um, they're big. They're big and bulky. Um, and most every Newtonian that you see on the market is really poor quality. That said, my Epsilon uh, astrograph that I have, that a lot of my pictures on the ASIC mm -hmm. site are shot with, is a Newtonian telescope. Um, it's, an ast it's been optimized for astrophotography, and it is by no means mechanically poor. But believe it or not, it's not mechanically great either. There's some fundamental problems with it, the way that it works. It's, it's not as mechanically good as you would think for a $3,000 telescope or $4,000 telescope. Um, Richie Christian, designed specifically for astrophotography. Um, this is a two-mirror system. You don't need, you don't need any uh, correctors or field flatteners. Actually, you kind of do because there's astigmatism, but we won't go there. Um, but you, you don't have to have a field flattener on these. They're very, very flat because of the way the mirrors are set up. Um, there are no cheap models of this telescope available. Um, the, you will not find one of these for below the tens of thousands in the most part, unfortunately. Um, that's the problem. They're very large. Uh, they have a huge secondary obstruction on them, so you're going to see decreased contrast. I know because I shot Saturn the other night just for grins of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, wow, you know, you, that's why they shoot those with refractors. <laughs> you know, I kind of got it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really not designed for... Um, uh, to, to generate high contrast, but for shooting deep sky objects, nebula fields, 